It's odd to reflect on and hard to believe, but it was March 25th, 2015 when I uploaded my first video on this channel. Going back to it, I can tolerate it and the cringe doesn't deeply trouble my soul, something I ironically can't say for much of my other content from that year, but it's evident I was still inexperienced. Viewers have obviously noticed the quality difference compared to my most recent videos, and so I've been asked to redo some of my older reviews. Normally, I prefer moving forward and covering other games instead, but it makes sense for Sonic Adventure, and I've had the idea for a while now. I think this is neat as a five-year channel anniversary, and there also seems to be revitalized interest in Sonic Adventure lately. Sure, YouTube has absolutely no shortage of polarizing discussion about it, but let's be honest, it's Sonic and people are going to click regardless. You did, didn't you? <laughs> Having said that, I do feel I have interesting points of critique and can provide a nuanced, balanced take on why, spoiler alert, I am not a big fan of the game, despite having a nostalgic fondness for it. So, let's dive in. I started getting antsy to revisit Sonic Adventure last summer. For a marketing job I was working at the time, we went on a four-day trip to Gamescom 2019 in Germany. It was a pleasant and memorable week. The hotel was top-notch, we had delicious wiener schnitzels, and it was all paid for. What more can you ask? Fast forward to the last day, and as a keepsake, I bought these two vinyl albums. When I returned home that night, you bet I listened to those bad boys, and man, is Sonic Adventure's soundtrack still fantastic. Since its inception, Sonic's had a reputation for awesome music, and now that Sega's sound team wasn't held back anymore by the limitations of the Mega Drive, they were free to go all out, and the end result shines. The production is steps above most other video game soundtracks from the 90s and early 2000s, as marvelous as some of them are too, and the mixing is excellent with rich, diversified instrumentation. There is a sense of cohesion to the sound, and that with so many different pieces and genres to boot. Almost every area you can think of has a unique and distinct track accompanying it, as do many of the bosses and minigames. Yet the length of the loops and quality of the compositions weren't sacrificed in the slightest. I don't love everything, but given how broad the selection is, it's brilliant I love as much as I do. character themes are enjoyable and reflective of their personalities, with special shoutouts going to the banging vocals and instrumentals in Amy's, despite the lyrics inferring she shaves her pussy to entice Sonic. It's kinda creepy, just try to block that out of your mind. A disappointing weak spot is definitely the cutscene music, there's not nearly enough original material written for them, and the character themes are recycled ad nauseum to compensate, but ignoring that, the soundtrack is A-class and one of my favorites in the series. Something else I've always appreciated about Sonic Adventure is its world and the aesthetic. The locales are full of defined landmarks and the stage theming is very diverse. You've got the sunny beaches and islands of Emerald Coast, the lounge hall, pinball tables, and underground ground dump in Casinopolis, the tall cliffs, zip lines and erupting volcanoes, and then the inside of a crater in Red Mountain, many of the levels feel like physical places in a way that many of the later installments don't quite pull off in my opinion. Of course, one of the contributing factors to that is the three hub worlds you'll be roaming around in between action stages. These help to contextualize and connect the placement of all the action stages within the game's setting at large, and while some suspension of disbelief is required, such as how the inside of Lost world is like a thousand times larger than it appears from the outside, you can chalk much of that up to technical restraints, and the developers got the idea across. The hubs themselves are also charming. I find the Mystic Ruins kinda bland, but it's novel to explore Eggman's floating masterpiece, the Egg Carrier, and see like the gang of cleanup robots doing their jobs, or that the doctor has a large swimming pool all to himself, and the citizens and tourists of the bustling station square have their miniature stories you can follow across the of a character's campaign. There's this girl who's nervous about talking to the guy in the burger shop and ultimately ends up working there, the mother
mother who keeps making up excuses for her gambling addiction and neglecting her son in the process, a player who seems to be dating more than one person and there's some drama over it, and yeah, <laughs> it's all superficial but totally optional and gives the city a smidge of life. In terms of gameplay though, these hubs don't serve all that much purpose. Um, where Super Mario 64 has Peach's Castle to facilitate the open-ended collectathon structure, and where Spyro the Dragon's hubs are functionally full stages on top of that, progression in Sonic Adventure is strictly linear, and what you do here rarely extends further than triggering cutscenes and putting keys in holes to unlock stages. It's pretty much filler. There is some optional stuff to find, mainly character upgrades and emblems, and that's that's cool. Many of these upgrades have minimal utility though, like Knuckles' fighting gloves, which I used to deal double damage to Chaos 6, and yeah, that, that, that's it. <laughs> Admittedly, Big's lore power-ups are needed to finish his extra missions, but trust me, we'll get to those. Thankfully, finding the way forward in the hub shouldn't take anybody too long for the most part. The fields are of a digestible size, the game usually nudges you towards your next destination, and Tikal can provide directions for lost players. Notice I did say for the most part, because there are a couple of potential speed bumps. At one point in Tails' campaign, for instance, you have to locate the jet anklet in this Echidna Tribe flashback area. If you don't know where it is, you can be searching for it for quite a while. This thing isn't even required anywhere in the game, so it's should have just been optional, and in a similar flashback as Amy, the camera points towards the same area you scoured as Tails, and then the cutscene ends. This is terribly misleading. You're actually supposed to just turn around and leave immediately, which stings more than you think, because Amy is slow, and so you could be wasting a significant amount of time here. And now that I mention Amy's speed, or lack thereof, that makes the hubs in general more of a slog to traverse as her and also big. You cross the maze-like jungle section of the Mystic Ruins twice with Amy, and it's just a chore. To be fair, she and Big should have been faster characters, period, and in the grand scheme, the hubs don't offend me. I see their appeal, but I also understand why they were axed in the sequel. Personally, I don't really mind either way. Moving on to the real meat of the game, Sonic Adventure is primarily made up of six different character campaigns. Outside of the shared hubs, each of them have their own gameplay style and story to tell, and the idea is that you finish them all to gain the full picture. Self-explanatory, we begin with Sonic, and right off the bat, I want to say he plays beautifully. He's responsive to button inputs, his acceleration feels natural, and even at top speed, Z never becomes unwieldy thanks to the fine-tuned sensitivity of the analog stick. The jumps allow for a lot of mid-air maneuverability, making more precise platforming very doable and comfortable, and the homing attack was an ingenious addition that alleviates the need for pinpoint accuracy in this 3D space. It also helps with flow and keeping your momentum going, which I think is important in a Sonic game. It's honestly outstanding how the developers practically nailed the controls on their first attempt, and it baffles me that so many subsequent titles feel inferior in some way or another. Why fix what wasn't broken? The spin dash is somewhat of a point of contention for fans. Um, rather than needing to stop and charge it, you can spam it in Sonic Adventure as some kind of infinite boost, and I guess I agree it could be toned down a bit. By the same token, it's a rush to spin dash around like a maniac. Uh, once you start experimenting with and pushing these mechanics to their limits, it becomes apparent how satisfying the level design itself can also be. In true Sonic fashion, there are so many possibilities for shortcuts here that I can show off only a fraction of them. Immediately in the first stage, Emerald Coast, there are at least four shortcuts that, when chained together in one perfect run, can shave off tons of time, and while not every level is as fancy with this, Windy Valley and Casinopolis are two that come to mind, things can get even crazier in others, full-on allowing you to bypass major chunks. The section I feel best demonstrates this is Act 3 of Sky Deck. A first time player is not gonna think to make this jump in order to skip the dash panels and swinging hooks. A first-time player is not gonna think to spin dash here to make it to the top before the gravity tilts and forces Sonic into climbing monkey bars. And a first-time player is not gonna think or have the skills to break the capsule using this small ramp and skip almost the entire act. Are these shortcuts you can perform all intended? Probably not, but if you ask me, that only adds to the fun rather than detract. 
Sadly, the snake part in Lost World and the platforming segment in Final Egg do stick out like sore thumbs. Both are slow and tedious, and I wish you could do something to speed up or circumvent them. You can in the DX version, but the methods have more to do with botched collision detection, so it doesn't really count as exploiting the layout. I'll take it regardless, but yeah. Another aspect that's been brought over from the classic titles is the secrets. The stages in Sonic Adventure are without a doubt more straight shots. You're not going to see as many multiple and intertwining pathways here, but there are countless little side areas where you can find goodies. There isn't much incentive, as like in Sonic 3, extra lives hold significantly less value than in Sonic 1 and 2, and Sonic 1 and 2 have the special stages that require rings to enter. Nevertheless, it can feel intrinsically rewarding to explore for this stuff, and the number of clips you're seeing really doesn't do justice to how much there is of it. Now that I think about it, perhaps even more so than the 16-bit games. Seriously, I just keep discovering and discovering bits and pieces of level design here that I've never seen before, and I can guarantee you that I'm still not aware of everything. The cherry on top is that no two stages are alike. In fact, of the 10 main ones Sonic goes through, all of them are divided into multiple acts as well. In Speed Highway, for example, you start on the city rooftops at night, then run down a tall skyscraper, and end up in the streets at ground level with the morning sun rising. It gives the levels a great sense of scale and progression, and it's clear Sonic Team put effort into keeping the player engaged with fresh gimmicks and set pieces. From the iconic whale chase in Emerald Coast to the tornado in Windy Valley, and from the roller coaster ride and bowling alleys in Twinkle Park, to the blackout segment with the mirrors and the gravity panels in Lost World, the stages are highly energetic and ever-changing thrill rides, which is impressive given their length and the sheer amount of modeling work. Combine that with the speedrun and exploration appeal, and there should be something for many types of players to enjoy as Sonic. That's not to say everything in this campaign is a home run. I've always found Windy Valley unremarkable with too much automation, the third act is comprised almost entirely of linear walkways and scripted loops, and Sky Deck, while a technically impressive stage and very creative, is marred severely by buggy mechanics, a wonky gravity gimmick that must be a disaster to put up with as a newcomer, and this obnoxious cannon that keeps rotating while you're trying to shoot a rocket into it. Damn, I hate that thing. The designers also attempted to add even more variety by shaking up the core mechanics here and there to varying degrees of success, let's just say. The pinball tables in Casinopolis, for example, are absolutely awful with butchered physics that do not behave in the way you'd expect them to, and then there's the snowboarding and ice cap. This part is alright, but the feel of it is a bit off with rough terrain, and it's mostly a visual spectacle. Exciting the first time, yes, but there's a complete absence of hazards and pits to avoid, and acing the stun ramps is only for flair. These minigames, if you will, could have used more time in the oven. They don't only show up in the action stages though, as some even get their own so-called sub-stages. There's Twinkle Circuit, which is piss easy, but also not forced upon the player, so whatever. The notorious ones are really Sky Chase 1 and 2, mandatory on-rail shooters you can survive by sitting in the corner and mashing the fire button, or placing the tornado in a corner and dropping the controller altogether, I'm not joking. There is a targeting system for points, and if you score high enough, you can obtain emblems, but let's be honest, many people won't give a rat's ass about that. I feel both of these acts either should have been more interesting on a base level, or made optional somehow. I don't need to play out how Sonic and Tails chase the egg carrier, unless it isn't boring and doesn't bog down the pacing of the campaign. As is fairly typical for platformers, the boss battles are also little to write home about. There isn't much complexity to them, and the ring system negates most of the challenge there may have been. The only encounter I've ever died in is Egg Viper, on account of the fact it's suspended over a giant bottomless pit. I'll never agree with the ring system not being reimagined for Sonic Adventure. It was basically invented as a crutch for the visibility issues stemming from a low-resolution side-scrolling playfield, so to jump to 3D makes it obsolete. They're adhering too closely to tradition here because it's holding back progression and improvement of the series. At least Egg Hornet and Chaos 6 can be defeated very swiftly with the right techniques, which reminds me of the classic Sonic titles, where how fast you could take out many of the bosses sort of makes up for their simplicity, but then of course there are the bosses that drag on. Egg Viper does with a lot of waiting around for Eggman to do his thing and open himself up, and Chaos 4 is the worst. His attacks are not dangerous at all, you'll just 
just be jumping around until the guy finally peeks above the surface and becomes damageable. Rinse and repeat for 5 cycles, it sucks. <laughs> Still, the good definitely outweighs the bad when it comes to Sonic's gameplay. The minigames and bosses may be average, but most of the action stages themselves remain a ton of fun today and are endlessly replayable. They are what I first think of when I think of Sonic Adventure, and for good reason. With the capable specs of the Dreamcast, however, the developers also wanted to expand on their storytelling. This starts with the characters themselves, who now verbally interact with each other and have their own thoughts and feelings, and I think they handled Sonic's character well. He's the same old hedgehog who's always looking for an adventure, and despite being cocky and having a little patience for bullshit, he'll go out of his way to help whoever and however he can. Some of the nuances of his personality from the later installments are missing. I don't know, he feels a bit less lively here. But the game takes what was previously established and displays it faithfully in more detail. The same applies to Eggman. He was always that menacing, evil scientist who's obsessed with his own intelligence, plastering his face all over his machinery and creations, yet kind of a goofball by design all the same. That's captured here as well, but the dialogue gives the Doctor extra flavor that's made him such a beloved villain. This dynamic between Sonic and Eggman is at the center of the campaign, and in some sense, Sonic's story is by the numbers, foil the bad guy's plans basically, but it's spruced up somewhat with a new bully in town. You see, Eggman reads up on this liquid-based creature, Chaos, that is rumored to evolve with every Chaos Emerald he's fed. Wanting to harness this power in order to devour Station Square, Eggman predictably frees Chaos and sets out to find all seven emeralds. I've always found Chaos a wicked character, since he's actually able to utilize individual emeralds, that's something the heroes could take a few pages from, his ever-evolving nature has you anticipating what his next form might be, and being a mute lends him some mysterious and unnerving vibes. He makes for a good plot device, though the writing for everything pertaining to the emeralds is pretty weak if I'm honest. For the first third or so of the campaign, Sonic and Tails' mission is to find as many emeralds as they can. Unfortunately, every time they get one, Eggman manages to steal it right after in the most embarrassing ways. If this happened once, then that'd be totally fine, but it happens three times in a row, which not only makes this portion of the campaign feel repetitive, it also makes Sonic and Tails look extremely incompetent. Then, much later, when the duo lands on the egg carrier, they leave behind and flat out forget about the emerald that was powering the tornado. That seems like a critical security risk, guys, but of course, Eggman and Chaos, who were always conveniently in the right place at the right time before, do not catch on to this whatsoever, because we can't have perfect chaos before the final story segment, now can we? And also, Big wouldn't be able to escape the Egg Carrier at the end of his campaign without an operational tornado. What I'm trying to get at here is that while I find the concept of chaos very cool, the events that lead up to his growth are contrived to keep the plot on track. I should stress that the general story in Sonic's campaign does the job of providing motivation and contextualizing your purpose in the stages. It's totally serviceable. But I wish they got more creative with how they, you know, showed off the various evolutions of chaos. There are six character campaigns, for crying out loud, and yet five of the emeralds are collected and lost by Sonic and Tails. I feel the distribution there could have been more even for the believability of the story and also to incentivize players to go through the rest of the campaigns. This is done with Chaos 2 in Knuckles' campaign, but imagine if Chaos 1, Chaos 3, and Chaos 5, for example, were bosses you didn't fight as Sonic, whereas you did as other characters. That would have been sick. It wasn't meant to be, sadly, and I think that's all I have to say about Sonic's campaign, really, so let's move on to the second playable character, Tails. Bluntly put, this is a nosedive in quality. Now, in terms of overall control and movement, Tails is just as fast, fluid, and responsive as Sonic. No complaints there. I mean, he can't spin dash or perform the homing attack, but his flight ability returns and flows well with a nice, organic descent as he tires out. He handles great. That being said, this flight is also one of the core reasons the gameplay falls flat. In Sonic 3, playing as Tails is often considered the easy mode already, with easier access to secrets and alternate routes. But since you're on a side-scrolling plane, it was still very possible and manageable for the developers to design levels where flying isn't game-breaking. When you're working with the 3D space, this is obviously much harder to do, and it feels as if they tried as much here as Capcom did with the 3D sections of Mega Man X7. Fuck, did I really just say that? Of the 10 stages Sonic goes through, 
through, Tails goes through five of those stages and only small parts of them as he races against Sonic in friendly competition. The problem is that much of the level design is catered towards Sonic, and because Tails can fly freely, you can skip over the vast majority of obstacles and take massive shortcuts. It's nothing like the shortcuts in Sonic's campaign either, which reward route knowledge of stage layouts and mechanical mastery, and whenever Tails isn't flying, either due to tight passages in Casinopolis or snowboarding in Ice Cap, I'm just replaying stuff from Sonic's campaign, almost verbatim. The only stage that works to some extent is Speed Highway, since the open nature of it allows Tails to take a wide variety of different paths and explore areas of the city rooftops that Sonic cannot. It can be pretty fun, but not even Eggman soaring in one of his flying eggmobiles proves to be any challenge to beat to the finish. Moreover, Tails' campaign has a noticeable pacing issue, as between action stages 3 and 4, you fight Chaos 4, go through both acts of Sky Chase, and play a sandboarding minigame. It's bad enough that you have to deal with the yawn-inducing Chaos 4 and on-rail Sky Chase shit again. Seriously, nothing changes here, and what I could give a pass before as mildly irritating now feels like obtrusive padding, but it's even worse all clumped together with no spread. At least, Sand Hill is exclusive to Tails' campaign, as is the Eggwalker boss battle at the end, but minigames and bosses aren't Sonic Adventure's forte anyway, so by and large, you can forget about unique and worthwhile content for Tails. The story actually suffers from a very similar issue. Since Tails tags along with Sonic for the majority of his campaign, and considering it is half the length, roughly two-thirds or so of the cutscenes are repeated from Sonic's. It's true that the dialogue, voice acting, and <coughs> cinematography have slight alterations. For instance, Eggman sounds more sinister and intimidating from Tails' perspective than from Sonic's. And while these are nifty touches, it's not sufficient to watch otherwise identical events play out all over again. As for the 33% where Tails is separated from Sonic, there is a bit of an arc of him gaining confidence in his own abilities, to get shit done without the friend who's always inspired him. It's quite a natural extension of Tails' character, you know, always running after Sonic and looking up to him? Though most of this actual development here only happens at the very end, when Tails overcomes his fears and stops Eggman from blowing up Station Square wholesale with a giant missile. It doesn't really land for me because it's a payoff with little setup. If the implication is that Tails is scared of Eggman, then why does he fight the Egg Hornets in Chaos 4? You can argue Sonic is by his side in these moments, but in this campaign, the player, and by extension Tails, is the one doing the actual work. The payoff would have been more satisfying and deserved had Sonic stepped in to do those fights, or if Tails in general had spent more time by himself with more focus on this aspect of his character. Since doing so also would have cut down on the repetition from Sonic's campaign, it'd be killing two birds with one stone. So, given that neither the gameplay nor the story are well executed, Tails' campaign is, regrettably, pretty lousy. The good news is that Knuckles' campaign holds its own better. As the Echidna, your job in each of his five action stages is to find three pieces of the Master Emerald randomly located out in the open, underground, or inside enemies or objects. This shifts the focus from high-speed platforming to exploration, and whether it is your cup of tea or not, from a design standpoint, it was probably the right call to make. Carried over from Sonic 3, Knuckles can glide and climb walls, which, again, would present a big challenge to integrate properly into the same linear levels as Sonic, with the same goal of simply reaching the end. Treasure hunting in sandbox maps, by contrast, makes sense for 3D Knuckles gameplay. Furthermore, the man is as free-flowing and quick as you'd hope, the stages are all confined and laid out in such a fashion that you can efficiently travel from one end to the other, and despite the fact that these are all sections Sonic goes through too, they work competently for both him and Knuckles. As more open-ended Sonic level design, it works due to the mix of intended paths and then the shortcuts I've talked about before, whereas as Knuckles, the openness and the nooks and crannies to scrub make the level design functional for treasure hunting. Hunting. Special mention goes to Red Mountain for this, which has a boatload of diversions for Sonic while still sporting a linear progression, and then as Knuckles, there are so many mountains to scale and potential places to hide emerald pieces. It's admirable. Still, the level design is only adequate for Knuckles. I like the scale and size of Red Mountain, but with the exception of Sky Deck, which has specific hatches that are opened by tilting gravity accordingly, none of the stages have interesting intricacies to work out. For gameplay like this, I want stages to have 
have a central gimmick or other types of mini puzzles and obstacles that affect how I get around or where I can and cannot get to at a given time. Without that, the levels are just samey playgrounds where I wank her about for collectibles. I also feel Takal's guidance is excessive since she can literally show you where to go. I mean, you already have a radar that is pretty generous and strong. Sometimes I enter a level and it immediately alarms me for multiple emerald pieces nearby. So when you combine the two, it kind of interferes with the point of the gameplay. As such, it's also not uncommon I finish stages in two minutes or even under a minute if I really want to. There isn't as much depth here as I'd like, but perhaps I'm only saying this because I've been playing Sonic Adventure since I was a little shit nugget. For newcomers, you know, there's probably sufficient challenge and the foundation is solid. As for Knuckles' story, well, frankly, you can sum up a good chunk of it as him going places to hunt for emerald pieces, and I've always found part of his character here silly. You see, early on, Knuckles runs into Eggman, who claims Sonic is after the Master Emerald too. As a result, Knuckles attacks Sonic in Mystic Ruins. Now, I know Knuckles is kind of a naive, gullible guy, but not only was this exact trick already pulled on him in Sonic 3, not only did Eggman tell him this after trying to kill him with Chaos, he instantly without being like, yo Sonic, long time no see, what you holding there? Mistakes the Chaos Emerald for a piece of the Master Emerald and assaults Sonic. There are so many red flags there and the fact Knuckles is blind to all of them is something I just cannot buy. Again, it feels like contriving some kind of reason to grow Chaos, but to be fair, there are also elements of this story I do enjoy. For one, I like the continuity of Knuckles being the protector of the Master Emerald to keep Angel Island afloat and seeing him reflect on that that job and wondering why he was given that purpose in the opening and epilogue gives us some insight into his mind. You discover he's actually quite the loner. They are endearing moments and good examples of these characters now representing more than sprites on the screen. His campaign also contains the starting point for the overarching plot at large, as on one peaceful night, Eggman breaks the Master Emerald in order to free Chaos and as such also to call, which is a nice bit of foreshadowing about their origins and also the game's conclusion. It fills in some of the blanks for Chaos in Sonic's campaign, and for what it's worth, this is a more original story and campaign as a whole than Tails is, with the only overlap between Knuckles and Sonic occurring during the Chaos 4 and Chaos 6 encounters. That does, however, mean that you have to fight both of them as well, marking the third time for that stupid Chaos 4 encounter. I'm left wondering why Knuckles couldn't just leave the job to Sonic and further pursue his own mission. Like with Tails' campaign, this screws with the continuity of the story and all you get for it in return is mindless repetition and padding. Not keen on that. No, I am not. Alright, well, with the classic trio done, we're finally getting into new character territory. Amy isn't a new character, but this is her playable debut in a main series game. This means the developers had the freedom to shape her abilities and gameplay from scratch, and what they came up with is quite lamey indeed. For starters, this girl is slow as ass. She climbs ladders as if she's hurling through mud, and her acceleration is remarkably sluggish, especially on any sort of incline that aren't stairs, causing me to constantly hop around to keep a pace going. She can't even jump on enemies. Instead, she has to use her Pico Pico hammer that halts all of her momentum unless it's used at top speed, in which case she performs this super jump that admittedly does give her some good distance and height. Even after getting the hang of her, however, Amy doesn't feel fun or smooth to play as by any platforming standards, let alone by Sonic standards. This is exacerbated by her overall gameplay. I guess it's supposed to be more reminiscent of your typical methodical platformer, and to give credit where it's due, at least Amy's received a lot of exclusive level design to her, like this Castle of Terror attraction in Twinkle Park. Nevertheless, it's uninspired and basic. I mean, there are jumps to make, hazards to avoid, and enemies to defeat? Yay? <laughs> it's hardly ever arranged in a way that provides ingenuity or challenge. With proper use of her hammer jump, there are opportunities to take shortcuts here and there and bypass slow sections, but I'm really stretching for something to praise here. Additionally, there are puzzles, but they just waste your time. Playing a guessing game of opening the correct door, hitting switches to open doors, inserting colored blocks into colored holes to open doors. I'm sorry, what is this, preschool? Hell, I haven't even mentioned Zero an invincible robot who chases Amy throughout stages because he's such an inconsequential threat. I do dig some of the scares in set pieces like Zero busting through walls Mr. X style or chasing you through a hallway with an impressive reflection technique for 1998. It's just a shame they have minimal impact considering he'll never catch you as long as you keep moving. 
Now, Amy does only have three action stages, but that's three too many for me. Hot Shelter in particular is long and always bores me to tears. If I have anything positive to say, it's that none of the previous minigames or boss fights are repeated here, and her whack-a-mole minigame that you play aboard the egg carrier is less of a pacebreaker than Sky Chase. Her zero boss fight is also inoffensive, it doesn't overstay its welcome in the slightest, and her story on its own ain't half bad either. The premise is that Amy Bud's head with the Flicky carrying one of the Chaos Emeralds in its pendant. Eggman is of course after this emerald to power up Chaos, so he sends out Zero to give chase. Amy decides to protect the little birdie and later down the line to help it reunite with its lost family. I think it's a wholesome little adventure with a happy ending for the animal. I've always found it somewhat touching. And you get to see that, even though Amy's that annoying brat who stalks her hero, she also has a very good heart with a strong will to help those in need. She doesn't get much, if any development, um, she starts and ends self-dependent and obsessed over Sonic, but the story does set a nice template for the character beyond being the stock damsel in distress she was in Sonic CD. Unlike the classic trio, however, Amy doesn't even seem to be aware of Chaos's existence, making her journey feel rather isolated from the core thread, and since Sonic is the one guarding and trying to rescue Amy, you will again be watching a handful of cutscenes you've already watched before. It's also weird how Sonic and Tails' campaigns show why Eggman kidnapped Amy in the first place? That's spoiling a part of her story and her only tie into Chaos. Why? <laughs> a similar mistake is made with the prison cell scene that involves E-102 Gamma, but more on that in a bit, because E-102 Gamma is our next playable character. Apparently, Sonic Team had been requested to add shooting components to a Sonic game, and since that would be an ill fit for the main characters, it was envisioned via one of Eggman's robots. A compelling concept that puts a unique spin on things, I have nothing against it, but the implementation contains such little substance that even the fucking Game Grumps were smooth sailing with Gamma. The shooting itself is as deep as a puddle. You're a walking tank that can effortlessly truck along while obliterating anything in your path by being a brain-dead button spammer. Due to the ring system, getting damaged also doesn't matter, and enemies don't stand a chance anyway, since they're largely the same simplistic ones you've dealt with as the other characters, where that simplicity is harmless because combat was never a driving factor. If there is a combo system where the more targets you manage to lock onto simultaneously, the more seconds are added to your timer, and this could have elevated the gameplay. Gamma, for some unexplained reason, is on a countdown timer, and you lose a life should it drop to zero. Unfortunately, this timer is so incredibly forgiving that, outside of a couple of the optional missions for emblems, you can safely ignore the combo system. It may provide some surface level satisfaction, but the developers failed to actually capitalize on it. Gamma controls well and is decently fast, so this could have been an interesting blend of racing against the clock and shooting mechanics doubly so if the enemies were more aggressive too. His last stage, Hot Shelter, reveals glimmers of that buried potential with a large chunk of tailor-made level design and a platforming set piece that complements Gamma's hover ability, but it's the most you're gonna get. The four stages before Hot Shelter, which are all truncated versions of Sonic levels, are too brief, and platforming is either virtually absent or neutered by the hover in the case of Windy Valley. To top it off, three of the five stages come to a head with a face-off against one of the other E-Series robots, and you can win all of them by standing still and shooting. Ugh, what were they doing? I should mention that the last boss on the egg carrier is more flashed out with an arsenal of attacks to dodge, and I actually think it's one of the more engaging bosses in Sonic Adventure. But why couldn't all the E-Series fights be more like this? Gamma's gameplay overall isn't bad, I'll take it over Tails, I suppose, and especially Amy. It's just too shallow, which is a bummer because his story is the best one. Beta. Through this campaign, you learn that Eggman isn't just out to build Robotnik land, but also a ruthless maniac who treats his own robots as disposable scrap metal when he deems them useless. As a result, Gamma, who used to carry out orders unconditionally, begins questioning his own master, and after a confrontation with Amy and the bird shows him what real compassion is, he turns against Eggman. Wanting to relieve his brothers and save the imprisoned animals inside, Gamma sets out to destroy the other E-Series robots, and of course, it dawns on him what that entails for himself too. Shortly after, he perishes from a fatal combat wound, and 
<laughs> Darn, somehow they got me kinda sad and emotional for the death of a robot. There is natural character development you follow every step of the way. Gamma is born and needs to prove himself to Eggman, but despite living up to expectations, he carves his own tragic path. And as fate would have it, the flicky inside him is none other than one of the birdie's siblings, so completion of the campaign is extra rewarding for explaining the ending of Amy's campaign. The first half of Gamma's campaign is a bit too cutscene heavy and akin to Amy, the story is far removed from the whole chaos shebang, yet I'm willing to let these complaints slide because what's presented is captivating. Not merely for the arc, but also because the awkward and limited cutscene animation is less distracting for Gamma as a mechanical being than the other characters, and other grievances I do have have more to do with the game's general storytelling decisions. The prison cell scene I mentioned earlier for Amy is when the most significant change within Gamma happens, but it plays out identically in both campaigns. This should have been cleverly edited out of Amy's campaign, seeing how it's lengthy and spoils half the reason why Gamma undergoes its transformation. The moment is crucial to Gamma's arc, not to Amy's, and Gamma is forgotten about in her story mere minutes later. Worse yet, right after comes a scene where Sonic and Tails, Amy and Gamma all bump into one another on the bridge of the Egg Carrier, and you guessed it, you watch it in full four fucking times. There is no excuse for this. It's mostly a setup for a character battle, and character battles are so worthless that I'm not even gonna waste my breath on them. So little of value would be lost if they cut the scene short to everybody splitting up. Sure, Amy protects Gamma, but wasn't everything else already enough for him to ditch Eggman? Was this worth this? It perfectly highlights why I don't like the multiple character perspectives. It was daring and promising on paper, and while sometimes the game takes advantage of it, other times there are missed opportunities, and way too often it leads to cutscenes and bits of gameplay repeating without shame. The pieces don't always click into place either. In Knuckles' campaign, you follow Gamma from Red Mountain to the Egg Carrier that's about to take off from Eggman's base. But then in Gamma's campaign, the Egg Carrier has already crashed by the time you visit Red Mountain. Similarly, Froggy has a yellow Chaos Emerald swallowed throughout Big's campaign. Meanwhile, in Tails' campaign, he swallows a red emerald in the jungle. Can the frog fit two jewels his size in his mouth? Why would Tails only pull out the red one? Ugh, never mind. Speaking of Froggy, it's our meme king, Big the Cat, and his gameplay sucks fat nuts. Firstly, fishing has no business being in a Sonic game unless it's some kind of optional content, alright? Secondly, it doesn't have merits of its own. It's mind-numbing and the mechanics themselves are unintuitive. What you do here is cast out your lore, let it sink, juke it left and right to get close enough to your target and catch its attention, hook your target once it takes the bait, and then reel it in without breaking the line. To begin with, the camera is atrocious. It's too zoomed in on the lore and you can't manually rotate or tilt it to get a better view. The camera automatically tracks the lore, so you can kind of manipulate it that way, but controlling the lore is fiddly because the movement direction reverses at random and sometimes it doesn't respond to inputs at all. Then you have to hope you don't catch the attention of the wrong fish, chances are you'll have to recast if that happens, but once you're in the reeling phase, the real fuckfest begins. The stress on the line isn't the problem, you have a meter for it and you can reel in fast, slow or not at all, it's getting the fish under control. Big's game instruction tells you to watch the movement of the fish and tug your rod accordingly, yet to this day, I still don't know how I'm supposed to react, and in the end, the fish seem to have a mind of their own anyway. Sometimes they're bloody persistent and fiercely swim off into whatever direction they feel like with nothing you can do about it. Seriously, look at this, look at this, he keeps going, stop it dude, stop it! Other times they put up almost no fight and are practically begging to get onto your lap. It's a total crapshoot, and you also want to make sure Big's actually sitting at the edge of the pool. If not, there's a chance the fish gets stuck or glitches off the hook, and obviously you don't want that. Mercifully, Froggy himself, which is your only main concern in the main story, isn't difficult or time-consuming to catch once you understand the mechanics, though it seems this could still be a nightmare if you don't. Even then, you go through the same exact routine on all four of big stages, only the scenery and the selection of fish is altered. So for as short as the campaign is, it's 
also the most monotonous. Don't get me wrong, I think the character himself is amusing, his goofy ass dancing, his simple and carefree nature, and his utter obliviousness to everything around him. But he's just a random cat on a wild goose chase, and every time he reunites with his friend in the level, Froggy is either snatched or appears to have escaped your hands off camera right after. The only relevance to the overarching plot is that Chaos's tail possesses Froggy or something, causing Froggy to swallow a Chaos Emerald and so Eggman searching for him. Um, okay, why didn't Chaos simply snag the emerald while Big was asleep? What, did, did Froggy get in the way? If so, the gods of Angel Island should hire Froggy to protect the Master Emerald instead. He puts up more of a fight than Knuckles. On a serious note, Big's story is just completely arbitrary, and even more arbitrary is that this dope gets a flashback from Tikal. To call, what are you trying to achieve here, girl? You're talking to the brickest of brick walls. Now, I've neglected to talk about these flashbacks so far because they frankly exist on a different piece of graph paper. Basically, at completely random intervals, To Call will show up and interrupt whatever your character is doing to exposit backstory that goes as such. In the distant past, Chaos used to be a benign, loving being that protected little Tamagotchis known as Chao at this altar, supported by the Master Emerald and Seven Chaos Emeralds. During that time, an ancient Echidna tribe lusted the power of the emeralds and raided the altar, harming the Chao and causing Chaos to turn into an angry, monstrous beast. In order to save the world from total destruction, Tikal, daughter of the Echidna tribe leader, sees no other option than to lock herself and Chaos up inside the Master Emerald. See, the backstory itself is kinda fascinating. It makes Chaos more than the God of Destruction for God of Destruction's sake. He became that because the incident made him perceive humans as greedy and savage, and he wants to avenge the Chow, but could the writers really not weave this in more organically? I get handing out information bit by bit to intrigue the player, but there are more of these flashbacks than necessary, with many things being shown or told twice, and ultimately they come off as disjointed, it's harder to care when they're abruptly shoved in your face. I already roll my eyes with Sonic Tails and Knuckles, but at least they are actively dealing with chaos. It's a nuisance, however, when this bitch pops up for Amy, Gamma, and Big, because they have no reason to be brought into it. And this leads me into another point, why isn't the Super Sonic segment unlocked after beating the game as all six characters just part of Sonic's campaign? I mean, I understand why, because the developers wanted to extend playtime. There were growing expectations for games to be longer in the late 90s, so I can't entirely hold that against them, and you could argue that it creates build-up and suspense for the ultimate climax. My counter-argument to that is that an effort should have been made then to make everybody playable and integral to the final story. As is, the other characters stand at the sidelines while Sonic saves the day. Regardless of whether you enjoy the other campaigns, they are not important to the showdown between Super Sonic and Perfect Chaos. With some tweaks to how Chaos's backstory is conveyed, which wouldn't hurt to begin with, all these other character scenarios could have perfectly existed alongside Sonic's campaign as alternate perspectives and side stories for those who want to play them and piece together the missing details, and with that kind of structure, all the recycled content where characters intersect, while still not ideal, also would have been more acceptable. As for the Supersonic segment, it's the conclusion to the story at large, and in some ways it's a good finale, and others not so much. The main disappointment for me is that it contains no action stages. This is a very short affair, and all the gameplay in the first half consists of triggering cutscenes in Mystic Ruins. It feels half-baked, which is not helped by the series of events that take place. So it turns out that after the crash of the Egg Carrier, Chaos is still alive and roaming around. What follows is that he beats the crap out of Eggman and Knuckles and obtains the six emeralds that were brought back to Angel Island. What I like about this is that it all but confirms that Chaos's intention from the beginning was to use Eggman as a puppet to acquire all the emeralds. It makes Chaos an even more curious and formidable antagonist than he already was, but... How in the hell did he, in his zero form, manage all this? Never mind that it happens off screen, making it an even tougher pill to swallow. That's nonsense. Even if we're assuming that he somehow stole the emeralds behind Knuckles' back, which would be idiotic in itself, 
Knuckles has consistently defeated various incarnations of Chaos before, including number 6. Then, as Sonic and Tails investigate Angel Island and are informed of the crisis at hand, they set out to search for the last Chaos Emerald, only to be interrupted yet again by Tikal. Soon after, they do find that 7th Emerald, but it gets scooped by Chaos at the very last second. Mwah, mwah, mwah. Smart move there, Tikal. If you didn't butt in, it's safe to assume Sonic and Tails would have secured that last Emerald. This whole whole setup struck me as slapped on and rushed and lazily presented for such a pivotal part of the story. Thankfully, the second half of this campaign is probably the most iconic part of the entire game. Station Square gets flooded in a visually spectacular CG scene for the time. It was definitely an oh shit moment that Sonic Team straight up showed how the city you've been trying to protect is wiped to utter shambles and then there he is, perfect chaos himself. It's finally happening, the destructive climax that the opening movie before the title screen gave tastes of and motivated you towards. Now, Chaos absorbing only the negative energy of the Emeralds enabling Sonic to go super by harnessing the positive energy is a concept that I've always found has little precedent set for it, but it's worth it to see him play as Super Sonic in 3D, and the showdown with Perfect Chaos is the best boss in the game. As you blast through Station Square, you have to maneuver around projectiles and beefy laser beams to maintain your speed and damage chaos, and this style of battle is more in line with what you'd expect out of a Sonic title. You're in full control of the pace, you don't have to wait for attacks and weak spots to reveal, and since rings now act as a countdown timer you can extend, this is probably the most challenging boss fight as well. Upon defeating him, Sonic neutralizes Chaos's anger with the positive energy of the Emeralds, and as Chaos sees a group of cheerful Chow singing in harmony, he and Tikal together ascend to the heavenly realm of the Master. Master Emerald, to carry out their protective duties in peace once again after thousands of years. It's a heartfelt moment. It was at the sacrifice of Station Square and many of its citizens, but the cycle of chaos being trapped inside the Master Emerald is broken, and we come full circle with the game's main vocal theme. The message is that if you let go of negative emotions and open your heart to others, life will turn out for the better, and I think it makes for a pretty sweet ending to go out on. For as memorable as this home stretch is, however, when I observe the narrative and structuring as a whole, it leaves something to be desired. There are aspects I appreciate that I've underlined, and props to Sonic Adventure for being one of the first platformers to attempt a more elaborate story. The only other example from the 90s that springs to my mind is Klonoa Door to Phantom Isle from the year before but the execution is simply too flawed for me to be properly invested. I'm sure a certain subset of people will think, bro, it's just a fucking Sonic story, chill. But I want to remind you of the fact the game features almost two and a half hours of cutscenes. I feel I have all the right to be demanding when there isn't close to that much meaningful content, and when I'm not really entertained for a lot of it. It's a sincere problem as far as I'm concerned, although I'd be lying if I said the presentation doesn't carry much of the blame as well. To start lightly, the direction and voice acting, it sort of hits that dry, dull middle ground where it was passable for the time maybe, but it's far from gripping today. This was their first first stab at having the cast speak, and the end result is strange is the best way I can put it. Sonic's rad attitude is laid on too thick and pretty forced. Hey there, bull brain! You better get Amy to me or I'll squash ya! I don't know what happened with Tails, period. I'm out of control! Mayday! Mayday! Going down! And Knuckles' actor sounds as bored as I did in my original Sonic Adventure review. Is this a dream? It's more like a nightmare. The only two performances I can get behind are Amy's and Eggman's. Amy has done well, and I think her high-pitched, squeaky voice sounds natural and befitting for the most part. Hey, Mr. Robot. I know you're not an evil sword. Wait, remember me? And Dean Bristow's Eggman, come on, it's just fabulous. Not all his delivery hits the mark, mind you, but he rocks that mad scientist aspect of Eggman and often steals the show. And on its ruins, I'll build Robotnik Land, the ultimate city, where I will rule it all. Come on, Chaos, let's find another emerald, shall we? 
Unfortunately, Eggman's ugly model and utter lack of mouth movement also makes his on-screen appearance the absolute worst out of all the characters. Look, I'm sorry, I know it's a dead fucking meme how miserable the cutscene animations and lip sync are, but at the same time it became a meme for a reason. I should cut it some slack, it was 1998 and many games then had stiff in-engine cutscenes, but this niggle in the back of my head remains that the Dreamcast is a vastly more powerful console than the Nintendo 64 and the PlayStation, thus allowing for higher production values. As the killer app for Sega's new generation of hardware, why couldn't Sonic Team be the one to push the envelope and set a new standard for developers to aspire to? Besides, it's not just the animation either. It's also the awkward and long pauses during interactions, bogging down the pacing significantly. Hey, we can't let him get away! Let's get to my workshop and we'll take the tornado! Yeah! You guys go. I have some unfinished business to take care of. The audio isn't mixed that well, making some lines difficult to make out. Now we must be destroyed at all. And as I've touched on before, the cutscenes didn't receive specially composed music. Taking into account how short and abundant events can be, this leads to a lot of jarring cutoffs, and you'll be hearing the same beginning parts of many tracks over and over. This reaches its peak with Gamma's campaign as a whole, and I facepalm at the end of Tails' campaign specifically, where his song starts over upon every scene change. I did it all by myself! Of course, I added the crossfades for pacing of the video, but why wasn't this fixed? Overall, these cutscenes are just hideous now, and more resources should have been put into them, which I feel is about the only critical statement I can make of this game without getting anybody's panties in a twist, but enough of that. Um, Sonic Adventure doesn't just have a main story on offer, as there's also a lot to sink your teeth into if you're a completionist and want to collect all 130 emblems. The bulk of this is made up of extra objectives that I'm going to get into right now. Beam Missions for Sonic, Tails, Amy, and Gamma require you to finish the level with 50 rings, which is as simple as it sounds. With the overabundance of rings in every stage, these all basically boil down to not getting hit near the goal. I think it would have been way more interesting if each of these missions had their own much higher ring requirements. This would encourage more exploration of the stages and also careful play to hold on to shield power-ups and not take damage. B missions for Knuckles ask that you find all the emerald pieces without using Tikal's assistance. These are okay, but with how breezy the treasure hunting is for me, I would have preferred them to be ring based too. Then there's the A missions for Sonic, Knuckles, Amy, and Gamma, where you have to beat the stages under a specific time limit or with a certain amount of time left in Gamma's case, and I like these. The ones for Sonic are pretty challenging if you haven't played the stages to death, and while it's sorta of random for Knuckles, it does test your knowledge of the maps and how quickly you can get around. As Gamma though, these missions are wildly inconsistent. In Emerald Coast, for example, you need to be fast and really work on your combo game, which demonstrates how there could have been depth to this gameplay I was talking about before, but then the times for Final Egg and Windy Valley are so lax that I question if they were even playtested. And sadly, all of these time-based missions for every character can be cheesed easily by dying or returning to your last checkpoint, since the timer resets along with it. Whoops. <laughs> the A missions for Tails are also completely fruitless. Beat an even faster Sonic? Right, right. Big, however, is the polar opposite. His extra missions come from the darkest depths of hell, dude. The A missions, the godforsaken A missions, catching a 2000 gram fish. This is where you'll really feel the wank of the inept and luck-based fishing mechanics, as you can get into tug-of-war battles with these super heavy fish for minutes and minutes on end, and it's the most frustrating and patience-tempering thing ever. Not to mention, the size of the fish is not a reliable indicator at all for its weight, neither are you informed of it when you hook the fish, so oftentimes I went through all that suffering just to be flipped off with 1940 grams or whatever. Lord have mercy on me. Hell, Twinkle Park doesn't even spawn 2000 gram fish until you find all four of the lore upgrades, because everybody knows that. By the way, one of these upgrades is located in Ice Cap. I repeat, 
Ice Cap, that's an action stage. All the other upgrades for every character, including Big, are found in the Hub Worlds, so the game's breaking its own rules here. What the fuck? All in all, while I respect the addition of extra objectives for those who are thirsty for more content, it mostly ranges from insufferable to shallow or easy to exploit. You also won't get the emblem for a mission unless you are on said mission. This means that even if you meet the requirements for both the B and A missions during the main story campaigns, you still have to finish that stage at least two additional times. I hate when games do shit like this, I really do. Another activity you'll have to occupy yourself with if you're going for 100% is one that Sonic Adventure and its sequel are also well remembered for, the Chow Garden, accessed through the Hub Worlds. These are like the Chow from the story and you raise them by feeding fruits and letting them inherit properties from the animals you save from badniks. Nice bit of classic contextualization there. By doing this you can change their appearance to your liking, and not only are there many variations of Chow you can create between a wide range of colors and physical features, you can also teach them all kinds of stuff. Playing an instrument, drawing, martial arts, you name it. Even jackhammering is part of the repertoire. Okay, jackhammering may be overselling it. If you're into virtual pet simulators, the Chow Garden can be a very addictive and adorable pastime, and the demand for it to return to the franchise is a clear testament to that. It saddens me to say though, after putting a good number of hours into it for this video, that the appeal has very much diminished as I've grown older. I found the process itself of raising Chow very mundane and time-consuming, and if I need a dose of cuteness, I'll go to my dogs instead. But you know, some emblems are acquired here and that's where the Chow races come in. Next to altering its looks, those animals you give to your Chow will also increase its stats. The higher the stats, the better your baby will perform in competition. Unless you make it a point of frequently pit stop at the Chow Garden over the course of a 130 emblem playthrough, be prepared to go back to stages over and over and over and over and over and over to farm animals. With some luck, you can get by with the Chow at moderately low levels, but the races themselves are practically automated, which I've always found a bit of a shame, I wish there was a bit more interactivity, and for some reason you cannot quit and restart a race in Sonic Adventure DX specifically, which is just grueling if you see far in advance you won't win. Luckily, as a happy accident if you will, DX does contain an exclusive exploit where you can indefinitely use the same animal, which gets your Chow up to speed exponentially faster, it's truly a gift. Beyond that, since DX lifted much of the code and many of the assets from Sonic Adventure 2 Battles Chow Garden, which is easily the smoothest and most in-depth in the series, there are more types of Chow thanks to the Hero and Dark Alliances, and a black market where you can purchase food and other jazz with the rings you amass in the main adventure. By comparison, the Chow Garden on Dreamcast feels like a buggy prototype, animals have a habit of wandering off the sections that are impossible to reach, commands for picking stuff up tend to act up, Gamma often thinks he's on water when he's not, and I could swear one of my Chow would sometimes fail to spawn, I'm dead serious. You're also required to transfer your Chow to the visual memory unit in order to view its stats, and that's such an inconvenience, so all around the Chow Garden is undoubtedly more fun in the DX edition of the game. When it comes to SADX as a whole, on the other hand, it is not among the best of ports. I hear the 2004 PC release and subsequent HD ports that are built off of it are the real dumpster fires, but I'd be here forever if I also recorded and covered those at extensive lengths, so I'm basing the following on the GameCube version, which is the one I grew up with. By far the biggest problem lies in the visuals. Various effects were either toned down or removed in the transition, particularly when it comes to transparencies due to fundamental differences differences in the graphics chips, and almost consistently throughout the game the lighting is inferior. Environments tend to look more flat, with less shadow definition, and the characters themselves often don't blend in well or look completely overexposed in certain scenes. I think some stages were brought over perfectly okay like Emerald Coast, where the simplified lighting system doesn't hamper the bright vibes at all, but then you lay eyes upon something like Final Egg, and part of the atmosphere and presence was clearly lost in translation. Textures have also suffered a bit, with some being noticeably lower quality on the GameCube than the Dreamcast, but I personally don't mind the textures that were entirely replaced, it just leads to a different aesthetic that I may or may not prefer depending on the area. Another peculiar issue is that the image on GameCube is blurrier, since Sega didn't disable the console's deflicker filter, meant to reduce interlaced flicker 
appearing on all two TVs in progressive scan mode. This was arguably deliberate as some kind of low performance cost anti-aliasing solution, but it's ugly, and since none of the other Sonic titles on GameCube exhibit this same quirk, I have a hunch it was more of an oversight. DX isn't all bad across the board, however, as some of the changed graphics, I think, are welcome and there are a handful of technical fixes. For instance, water in many places of the game appears less chunky and choppy. The character models for the heroes are more rounded with individually modeled fingers thanks to higher polygon counts. Texture rendering itself has seen some cleanup with removal of jittering artifacts and better filtering that smooths out the various steps of mid-map sizes and perhaps most important Importantly, the target frame rate has been bumped from 30 to 60 frames per second. Granted, the GameCube version isn't consistent with it and frequently dips back to 30 FPS, but the Dreamcast also has plenty of instances where the performance either stumbles or completely shits the bed and the console outright chugs. If you thought Skydeck was one busted ass of a level in any of the re-releases, then oh boy, you're in for a treat here. Plus, loading takes longer on Dreamcast. The music resets upon screen transitions within the hop worlds, and a few very glaring cutscene animation and sound effect anomalies somehow slip through the cracks. Hey Knuckles, what's up? What are you doing, Knuckles? Don't mess with me now. Additionally, in DX, they added the ability to skip cutscenes, which is invaluable and a huge bonus for repeat playthroughs of the game. You get a map in the hub worlds, which may aid in navigation, especially in the jungle area of the Mystic Ruins, and there is a free camera mode that can help remedy some of the camera snafus, particularly when trying to backtrack in a stage or when pulling off some tricky dicky stunts the devs perhaps didn't intend. Now, there seems to be a common belief that DX is more glitchy, with the collision detection being the largest just defender, and your mileage may vary, but unless I am intentionally seeking it out for speedrunning such as here, I ain't seeing it. For this review, I've played the Dreamcast original and the GameCube release of DX to 130 emblems completion, that's around 25 hours each, and I've experienced moments of clipping through geometry about equally in both. Sonic Adventure from the beginning has been rough around the edges with funky collision, aforementioned stage gimmicks that lack polish, scripted segments that can break by no fault of the player, such as the whale chase or boulder chase if you do something incorrectly in them, a camera that can be uncooperative or on occasion get trapped or spaz out completely, and other random shenanigans that can lead to unfair deaths. Overall, this jank factor isn't severe or constant enough that it becomes game-breaking, at least not for me, but it is definitely present, and by whichever amount DX may have added to it, is small potatoes. Still, none of the above negates that DX is a half-assed porting job. Bearing in mind it came out four to five years later than the Dreamcast original, there's a little justification for all the graphical downgrades, and the more significant benefits the GameCube version has were either very easy and quick to implement, or are a natural byproduct of the hardware being more advanced. Most of the things that would have taken substantial effort, like overhauling the cutscene animations and pacing, or tightening up the gameplay and reducing that jank factor, to update and refine the total package, simply weren't bothered with. Consequently, SADX was dated compared to actual GameCube games before it even hit store shelves. And for the record, that's not me saying this port is why the game has gone on to be received less favorably ever since 1998. It's still the same Sonic Adventure underneath the surface, and I believe that Sonic Adventure was always deeply flawed, which became increasingly apparent as the wow factor wore off. I came to a similar conclusion in my 2015 review, but it's more obvious than ever now that the experience doesn't hold up for me. The cutscenes burn to the ground what may have been a fine story to follow. There's a striking amount of repetition of content where I can't help but get bored and distracted, and too much of the gameplay is mediocre and underdeveloped, I come out feeling empty and unfulfilled. Multiple playable characters and variety was all the rage in platformers back then, but studios like Naughty Dog, Insomniac Games, and Rare, all started by establishing a core foundation before they proceeded to introduce all the extra shit they could come up with. And even then, how they implemented these elements was still far from perfect. 
I genuinely do have admiration for Sonic Adventure for how big and visually stunning it was when it came out, and I can understand and see what's beloved about it. There was undeniably passion put into this game. Fuck, Sonic Team even traveled to Central and South America to do up inspiration for the environment. But to have an intertwining story set up across six campaigns, six playable characters with different playstyles, mini-games, boss battles, hub worlds, a chow garden, all that crammed into your first 3D outing with rough a year and a half of development, and for a console that was still in the midst of being engineered, I feel the project crumbled under the weight of its own ambition and turned out a mess. Now, I want to reiterate that I still get great kicks out of Sonic's action stages and consider them to be the best conceptual way to handle the blue fuzzball in 3D. They translate many of the classic Sonic design principles so well, and I don't think I'll ever tire of them. When viewed from this prison, yeah, I'll always love this game. However, even Sonic's gameplay is held together by the popsicle sticks and glue that is the programming, and I can only wonder if Sonic Adventure as a whole would have been more timeless had the scope been toned down, and if more care and focus went into bringing Sonic himself, perhaps Tails and Knuckles as well, into the 3D world as best as they possibly could, first and foremost. The rest could have come later. And there we have it, folks. A fucking RZ review after a year and a half of radio silence. Thanks for watching, I hope this was a worthy return and that you enjoyed it, and may this mark a new era for the channel with more consistent uploads to come. Peace out.